John 21, 1 to 14. It says, Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, who was called Didymus, Nathaniel from Canaan and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple who Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you've just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask them, Who are you? For they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Ted, come and share with us this morning. <coughs> I was just thinking as they were dismissing the children how important that ministry is because almost 70 years ago I sat there in this church. Actually Howard Begum said, I didn't realize you grew up at Oxford. Yes, I did. Years and years ago. I was one of the Sunday school kids in this church, not in this building obviously. This was a different building at that time. I remember it well, that part of it. <coughs> Mrs. Showers was one of my teachers, and I can't remember others, but uh, that was one. But I just thought of that here, um, 70 years later, I stand, almost 70 years later, I stand in this pulpit preaching the gospel. Would I ever have imagined that? <laughs> Never. Actually, I did not plan to go into ministry. I planned to be a police officer. I was, and God changed that call and called me into ministry a number of years ago, and I thank God for the opportunity I've had to, to minister for the last uh, 40 years, basically, from uh, going off to Bible school to uh, pastoring a little church in Saskatchewan and then other places, and then counseling ministry. God has been so good to us. So I want to remind you that these little ones, though they can sometimes be a little disruptive, <laughs> Because I probably was there. I, does anybody remember when I was a little kid? No, I'm not going to ask. <laughs> I might be in trouble. Um, I, I, I was known as a little bit of a troublemaker, and sometimes still am. <laughs> Try to curb that a little bit. But I just, I just thought it was so important to remind you that these little ones, God has a plan for them, each one of them, and God has a purpose, and we need to, need to follow God's plan and purpose. I want to turn to John chapter 20 and verse 21, or chapter 20 and chapter 21 for a moment this morning. But before we do, I, I, I say to you, I, I thank God for the opportunity of being here again. You, to be invited once is a thrill, but to be invited a second time, wow. <laughs> uh, God, is, God is doing marvelous work, and I thank God for that. I thank God for Robin and for Jason and the board for the, for the opportunity of sharing again as God would lead us. It's not about me. I've had a chance to be a transition pastor in a couple of churches a few years ago at South Zora for about six months, and then shortly after that I was at the Berea and now the Rock for about 14 or 15 months. And I always maintain, I always maintain, don't look at the man behind the pulpit, look at the message he presents. Okay, because we are frail. We, we will say things sometimes that we regret, and we'll talk about that just in a few moments. But sometimes we need to just stop and focus on who God is and what God wants to do in our lives. So can we do that now? Can we just pray and ask God to guide us as we seek to know His will and His purpose for this passage 
and for us today. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you, Father, that we understand again that we need to delve into your word and allow your word to be that guiding factor in every one of our lives, whether we're three or six or seven years old or 83 or 86 or 87 years old. Father, we never quit learning. I pray we never ever give up on scripture. We never uh, want to allow your spirit to be uh, squashed in our life. We want to have that vibrancy of your spirit all the time in our hearts and our lives as we honor the Lord. And Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for faith and trust. And we thank you, Father, for that relationship we have with you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. We're, we're, in a, we're in a transition here in Scripture. Remember, Jesus died on the cross. Remember in that, in that story that you know that he rose from the dead on the third day. Now we're in that 40-day period before he ascended to heaven. And Jesus has already re revealed himself twice to the disciples. First of all, without Thomas, and secondly, with Thomas, because Thomas had some issues too, and, and uh, the Lord, first of all, was for peace, second thing, it was for encouragement and instruction in what God had for them. And as you heard in the passage, it's the third time the Lord appeared to the disciples. Uh, I want us to catch a little bit of that, because it's, it's a transition time. It's a time where what, what's next step? Uh, my wife and I are facing that right now. I uh, pastored for, this is not a pipe bomb, by the way. Um, um, I, I, I pastored for a number of years, and the last three and a half years, uh, part-time in a little church south of Tilsonburg. And then I, tra then I transitioned into uh, what I thought was going to be full-time retirement. I, I retired last last. Um, October, and I wasn't praying for another work. I was praying for God to lead me into some type of retirement. And uh, as I was praying, oh, I'm showing you what I got there. I, as I was praying about uh, what what God would have for us, not particularly for ministry, but then I get a call about the middle of December from my son, who pastors over in St. Catherine, and said, "Dad, you want a job?" I said, "No." <laughs> don't you know what retirement means? No, I don't want a job. He's come talk to me. So I went over and talked to their board and, uh, and their leadership, and uh, I'm working one day a week. Uh, you know, all pastors only work one day a week, right? <laughs> I, I'm going over one day a week to do counseling. That was six months, and now it's going to be a year, and we're just uh, delighted to be part of that. But, but even transitioning to where we fit in. Uh, and Nancy and I have been struggling with this over the last few months, just what God would have for us. I don't want to sit and stagnate. I don't want to sit and be critical and as I see some can be I want to be able to be used of God in a, in a way that God wants to use me in a very special way and so as I transition I pray that you'll pray for me it's, it's, it's not good to be idle but it's, it's also not good to just go out to, uh, without really direction from God now Peter said let's go fishing anybody want to go fishing? How many, how many of you like to fish? Uh, I, I understand. Well, there's a few. I understand that, uh, that, that he didn't have a rod. He had a net. This was, this was a special gift for me. I, actually, I've got two of them. An the elderly gentleman that I had been caregiver for, and he said, uh, when he was passing away, he said, I have a gift for you. And I said, he said, it's a fishing rod. Actually, two fishing rods I specially made. And I said, well, I, I think you should give them to your grandchildren. And I never thought any more of it than that after his funeral, the family came to me and said, this is what Dad wanted you to have. Not the grandchildren, but you. And we are thankful. And I praise the Lord that I have this. I was just talking to Bill about how I could get a, a rod, or a reel for this, because I've been using the virgin. It's never been used. And a second one. So anybody want to join me fishing? That's what Peter did, you know. Peter looked around and transitioning. He didn't know what the next step was. So it says in the passage very clearly, I, I want to go fishing. Anybody want to go fishing? Would you rather go fishing than be? Oh, I'm going to ask you. <laughs> but think about it for a moment. It, it's, it's not good to have idle hands, but it's also not good to go up without direction from God and direction from God's uh, leading and guiding in our hearts and our lives. Transition periods can be very hard, and, and it, it's, see, Tiberius is, is a 
the Sea of Galilee, and, and I have had the opportunity, my wife and I had the opportunity to be on that sea a few years ago as we took a trip to Israel, and we just thank God for that uh, time. But when Peter said, let's go fishing, the other guy said, let's go, let's, let's all go, that's, that's the plan. And so they went fishing. That's my, that's my first point here. They went fishing. Whether, whether they're right or wrong, and you read the commentary, some people said, well, they should have been in prayer. They should have been out fishing. Maybe so, maybe so. But uh, I think there's lessons here for me, and I hope for you as well, as we think about Peter's... Uh, Peter, Peter reminds me a little bit of myself sometimes. You know, I know what I want to do, and, and I know how it needs to be done, so let's just get it done. I think that's a fault at times because we don't uh, wait upon the Lord and I, I, I was guilty of that in the first part of ministry. Uh, let's just get to the work that needs to be done and let's, let's do it. Rather than uh, staying alert, staying aware of what uh, God would do. See, Jesus would come into their lives and then disappear for a while and then reappear. And here we find ourselves um, in a situation where uh, they were going fishing. Nothing wrong with fishing. I love to fish. I love to take some time just to relax. And sometimes it's easier to go fishing than it is to pray. Sometimes I just want to get away. And I, we can, I, by the way, I can fly in boat. Okay, I really can. But, but, and then God did not call them specifically to pray here, but I wonder sometimes if, that were, is that, if that's where God would want them to be. The Spirit, it's time for us to sometimes just wait upon God. That's what Nancy and I are doing right now as we seek God's direction for what He would have for us in the future. It's easy to get busy, but if it's not just busyness. I, I realize idleness can cause problems, but if we stop and realize that it's, it's in God's hands and in God's direction in our lives, they caught nothing. They, uh, I, I draw this conclusion, you know, without God it's impossible, and we, we, we can't succeed, and if you look back in, in John chapter 15 particularly, he said, I am fine, you branches, without me you can do nothing. And even, even, in, even in my relaxation time, I need to find time to say, God, what would you have me do? What would I do in this idle time that I don't get caught up with something that I shouldn't? And just allow your spirit to work in our hearts and our life. I love Peter because he was uh, very sincere in whatever he did. He was a little impulsive and a little self confident at times. He worked hard, but he believed that what he was doing was the will of God. He wasn't, I, I pray, not motivated by the flesh, because if we're motivated by the flesh, we will fail. And if we stop and evaluate in our lives, and are we, are we just fishing? Or are we allowing God's Spirit to work in our hearts and our lives? It says that uh, just as the day was breaking, Jesus, was, uh, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And he said to them, children, do you have any fish? <laughs> Might be a little embarrassing. These are fishermen. Seven of the twelve disciples come from a fishing background. These were professional fishermen. And, but yet, if they were honest. They said no. They didn't try to explain why. They just said, no, we haven't. And Jesus said to them, throw your nets on the other side of the boat. I, I'm wondering if Peter was thinking back to when he was called. Remember when he's called in Luke chapter 5? He was fishing and uh, caught nothing and, and Jesus gave the instruction and the, the, the catch was so big that the nets broke. I wonder if that was just a clue for Peter that something was going on here. But, but at first it doesn't appear that way. I, I not only see the disciples fishing, but I also see the disciples' friend. Even though they did not recognize him, he was there. And do you realize in the midst of the struggles we face, Jesus is alongside through the Holy Spirit working in my life and in my heart. He knows every need of my life, so I don't need to fret. I don't need to worry about what the future holds. I need to cast my care upon Him because the Bible says He cares for me. He cares for every need in my heart. He wants to meet that need, and we'll see that in a moment. He wants to meet that need, and I want to challenge you that when you think you're all alone, when you think nobody cares, Jesus cares. He cares in the, the grief I face. I've gone through a lot of grief personally. 
I've been through seminars dealing with grief, helping people through grief, and I, and I realize that the most difficult times in life, when we're feeling all alone, we can cry out to God. When my father, I may have told this story before, but it's, it's been very meaningful to me. When my father died, I was in just starting my first ministry in, in 1979, and my father dropped dead quite suddenly of a massive heart attack. But a month after he died, I said to my wife, I, I just need to get out of here. And she said, what do you mean, get out of here? No, 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 I'm not leaving. I, I just needed, I need, some, I need some space. I was living in Thunder Bay, and I, I had a trailer that I borrowed to move from Saskatchewan. I said, I'm going to take the trailer back, 16-hour drive. When do you be back? I said, tomorrow. I, I love to drive. I drove for 16 hours. And I had my, my uh, wrestle with God, saying, Lord, why is this happening? How come that you've taken away my dad in this very crucial time of my life? And I, and I remember stopping in Brandon, Manitoba, and, and I guess the tears, or at least, at least it was evident that I had been crying, and the guy that served went back when they didn't serve gas. <laughs> the guy that served gas said, are you all right? I said, yeah, I just lost my dad, going through some stuff, and he said, okay. And he just said, wow, that must be tough. Went out to Saskatchewan, returned the trailer, and that's where I went to school at Briarcrest. Um, left the trailer there and didn't leave the next day. I was a little more exhausted than I thought I would be, and I left there about noon. And I remember driving back through Brandon, Manitoba. I actually stopped at the same service station. And all of a sudden it hit me, wow, what happened? I, I don't feel the same uh, torn apart as I was before. I don't seem to feel the same emotion. And I realized somewhere between Brandon and back to Brandon again, God had said, it's okay, Ted, it's okay. I am in control. It was like a burden was lifted. I came home, got home at 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> My wife was a little concerned. We didn't have cell phones back then. My wife was a little concerned, so she woke up and she heard me come in the door. She said, are you all right? And I said, yeah, I'm fine. Very, very exhausted. Emotionally tired, but physically, or spiritually, I'm refreshed because I've had a time just to be alone with God. And so sometimes that could be off fishing. <laughs> just alone with God. Just to spend time. But here's Jesus standing on the shore, and he, he asks them, he's very, he's very bold, children, do you have any fish? And he, they said, no, we'll cast you net on the other side. Have a bit of, bit of struggle, you know, carrying that net and throwing the other side. Is this, is this really profitable to go from one side, the width of the boat, to the other side to catch fish? Are you crazy? But it didn't seem that they, that there must have been some sense of God's direction in their lives, because they didn't question it, they just did it. Sometimes God speaks to me through people, Many, many times through my life. And I just need to listen. I don't need to say, well, that's not what God has in mind. I just need to listen to what God will do and God says to me through others and allow others to speak to my heart and my life. Jesus knows our need and he has a desire to meet that need, but we have to be open to receive him as personal Savior, first of all, and then to be open to follow the direction that he gives in our lives. And they seem to obey it, don't, be, don't be discouraged by the failures of the past. When you see a different direction, move forward to that direction and say, Lord, I, I want to be refreshed in what you will do in my heart and my life as I wait upon you. Don't look for the way out. Look for the way through. You hear me? Don't look for the way out. Don't say, well, Lord, just remove this from me. No, no, God has a purpose there. And uh, Lord, see me through this. I often say to people going through grief, we want to go around the grief or under the grief, but we don't want to hit the grief head on. And I say the best way to heal is to hit the grief, hit the grief head on. Say, I'm in pain and it hurts. And confess that to God. And God begins to do a work in me because I've identified that this hurts. You remember I, I referred to last week about Joseph's life, and I really believe this. Joseph said, you meant it for evil. He said, you meant it to hurt me, but God meant it for good when he was forgiven, when he was showing his forgiveness. He had already forgiven him, by the way. He said, you meant it for evil. It hurt. God meant it for good. God had a greater purpose in mind, and somehow I need to see that great, greater purpose. Don't look for a way out. Look for a way through. See, God is looking for faithful people because God is looking for faithful people that He can bless. That He can bless. If that is not my blessing, 
It's not the pastor, but it's what God will do through our lives to help us to reach out to others. Because remember the fishing illustration here. We are called to be fishermen. You know that? Fishers of men. And, and if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, he says, He comforts us that we may be able to comfort anyone who's in trouble. That's my fisherman part of it. I need to be able to reach out to other people and allow God to work in my heart and my life that not only to comfort them, but I pray that someday through my testimony, through what God has done in my life, not what I've done, but what God has done in my life, they'll come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Humbling ourselves to believe God's perfect plan and per perfect purpose in my heart and in my life is a key, key ingredient as I wait upon Him every day. And then thirdly, the disciples' faith. Not only their fishing, not only um, the fact that um, there's that sense of His uh, direction in their lives every moment of every day as we see his, the friends standing on that shore, they, they just obediently cast on the other side. <coughs> Seem foolish to men, but obedience to Christ is never foolish. Their center, self-centered service will bring barren results. Christ-centered service is fruitful. Look at John chapter 15. We don't have time this morning, but read through that passage. Instruction was clear. They just, there was no discussion. They just did it, and they succeeded. Fish. It says there was 153 fish in that net. If I'm doing something, even, even in God's Word, if I'm doing something on my own wisdom, my own strength, I'm probably going to fail. I've failed a few times, obviously. Obviously we do. We get something in our mind, it's a program we want to do, and, and we really haven't prayed it through. We just think, well, this, this, somebody else is doing this, so it must work here, and, and, and all of a sudden it just falls flat, and we wonder why. God wasn't in it. It may work over there, but it may not work here. It, it, it's, a, it's a different society today. We need to not use all the old methods. We need to be, adapt to what God has for this generation. And I pray that that's true for us that are older, not to sit back and be critical of, well, we always did it this way. <laughs> no, we can't do that, can we? Because this is a different generation, and we need to be uh, willing to allow God's Spirit to work in many of our lives and hearts. Sometimes success grows, listen to this statement, sometimes success grows through failure. When I understand I failed, I, I recognize, I need to look back and say, okay, what happened there? And I, and I maybe, maybe just simply a lack of prayer. Maybe just simply a lack of bowing before God and allowing God to do that work in my heart, in the life of my leadership, if that's the case, that, that we would see God's hand in God's direction. And then we see, um, so, so failure can be a good thing in, in a sense of learning, growing. I've often said to people, I'm, I'm content with my life. I'm content with all things that go on in my life. They say, you never made a mistake? Well, yeah, I've made lots of mistakes. So how can you be content then? Well, because I've learned from my mistakes. I've grown. I'm a better person today because of my dad's death death when I was 32 than I could ever be because God was, is doing a work in me. And when I think of that, I still miss him. My mom's passed away. My older brother just recently passed away just a year ago. I miss him. But I know God is at work, and that's important. Notice the disciples find. It says here, in this passage, they, they uh, cast their nets. He told them to cast their nets and said he had, they had a, a multitude of fish. The disciple, the disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore said, the disciple who loved Jesus, pardon me, um, said to Peter, it is the Lord. John, John, the one who was at the cross, the one who was on at Jesus' side at the Last Supper, here's the beloved John saying, that's God and God. Peter, I mean, <laughs> again, I love this guy because sometimes it's like I am. Sometimes I just do things that he put on his uh, outer coat because he'd taken off his outer coat to, to fish because it was hard work. He put his coat on, jumped in the water, and off he went. God's supply in God's time. 
Let me share something else with you from Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. It's talking about tithe. It's talking about if you just be faithful to me, watch how I'll open the windows of heaven and pour a blessing. My experience, and, and again, years ago I may have shared this with you, but, but it's real for me. My experience was, in, I was a police officer, I was doing well, my, my wife was a teacher, we're making good money together, I had a good life. We had all the toys, we had a snowmobile, we had a boat. I don't know if I ever used the boat or not. <laughs> That's something. I had a four-wheel drive truck that I don't know why I had a four-wheel drive truck that I wanted one, so I bought one. Had a car, had all the toys. And one day, and we were going to church, one day God said to me through the preachers, but you're just throwing $10 the offering, $15 the offering. And I said, I went home and I thought, oh, i got to tithe, they've got to find a way to do this. And I looked at my finances, I, well, I can't afford to tithe this. I guess still pay for the snowmobile, and still got to pay for the truck, and still got, you know, all the toys. And I looked at it and said, I can't afford the time. I don't have 10% to give. About three weeks later, or just a short time later, the, the pastor said this. He was in a series on tithing. He said, you can't afford not to tithe. Is that a concept for me? Can't afford not to tithe? He said, probably God has taken out of the back pocket what you're not putting to him. So I was really challenged. I was really uh, in a bit of distress. How am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? You hear me? How am I going to do this? And so we sat down, my wife and I sat down, we looked at the figures, no, it's not possible. Let's tithe first. I don't know how the bills are going to get paid, but let's learn to tithe. Let's start tithing. And we started right at the at the very, to, me, to my mind, the bottom end, 10%. That's where you start, in my mind. And I cannot explain this, but all our bills were paid. All our bills were paid. Everything was taken care of. Because, and when I look back, there was a few little things. The, the uh, transmission on the truck had some repairs and had to replace that. And it seemed that some of those things kind of disappeared after I started tithing. Uh, maybe there's some, maybe there's something here. If I, if I just honor God first, if I allow God to work in my heart, that's not just in, that's not just in, in tithing. That's in prayer. That's in every part of my life as I honor Him in my heart and in my life. If I, if I take that to its conclusion, I need to be totally surrendered to Him. If I'm going fishing. I hope I pray that God will guide me to be a witness to the people I meet in the dock, to the person I buy the worms from, to be able to say, Lord, you use me in whatever capacity. That's the way we tackle the counseling. Lord, use us. And then we came up with the name Hope Counseling. And you know something? That was, a, that was a spark for many people. Why do you call yourself Hope? Because it's hope in Christ. And our... Helping obtain personal or partner enrichment was the was the acrostic for that. But but I, we want to help people. We want to show people that there is hope in life. There's hope in relationships. And we pray that God would use that, and He did in so many ways. When the disciples, or when John saw it was the Lord, recognized that he, uh, Peter plunged into the water, went to the shore, and you you you've heard the story here already. Um, the, the, um, they were not far from land. There's, there's this charcoal fire. And here's another message that, that one of the pastors can develop sometime. The charcoal fire. There's another charcoal fire in chapter 18. Charcoal fire of the, of the world's fire, where Peter was kind of moving away and denying the Lord. And, and he, he uh, literally warmed himself by the, I, I call it the, the world's fire. Because it was chilly and he went over this way rather than get close to where the trouble was in his mind, he came over here and warmed himself. And I wonder the charcoal, the same word used, I wonder the charcoal of fire here was a reminder to Peter, hey, one day I was denying the Lord. And now here it's the Lord's fire. There's charcoal, there's a fish on it, there's a and one one of the scholars say one fish and one loaf of bread. I, I don't know if that's 
cooperated or not. But here we are, um, Peter plunging in. Here's the fire of God. Here's the Lord standing and preparing a meal for them. I love once in a while going for breakfast with my sweetheart. I love, we just did this last week after uh, an early morning, had to do some business and we went for breakfast and just sat in a restaurant in Tilsburg and just enjoyed a breakfast together. How much greater would this breakfast be with Jesus? He invited them, and actually there's three invitations here. He says in chapter 1, come and see. He says in chapter 7, come and drink. And he says here, come and have breakfast, come and dine. Again, there's some thoughts that we can develop further at another time. Christ met his physical need. And I'm not going to get into this because my time is gone. But there's a, there's a greater need here. It says that um, here, he said, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew who was the Lord. Jesus came and took bread and gave it to them. So with the fish. He told them to bring their fish and they dragged the nets in, 153 fish. Wow. Wow. He meant his, and, and I've always been mindful of this, especially in counseling. I need to meet the immediate need to allow God to direct the spiritual need. If somebody came to me and said, I'm, under, I'm in depression, I'm, I'm struggling with anxiety, and I say, well, you need the Lord. They said, pardon? You didn't hear me. I want to meet that depression or that anxiety and then and show how God can do a greater work in their lives. And that, that's always been my philosophy. Jesus did that with a woman well, and, and it, throughout Scripture, it, it's allowing God to use us. So I'm saying to you, when you go to the world, when you're in your home, when you're in your neighborhood, be, be conscious of people's deeds. Be conscious of, they just lost a loved one, I'm going to take a dinner over, or I'm just going to be there to, to comfort them, even though I feel inadequate to do that, I, I want to be there. And you'll be, you'll be absolutely, or at least I am absolutely amazed how God opens the door, and you, you're able to say, they say, well, how, how come you have such great faith? Because of Christ. Because of what Christ does in our hearts and our lives. Did you notice that Peter denied Jesus three times? And here, three times he said, do you love me? Do you love me? Peter got a little annoyed. Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. Feed my sheep. I, I want to suggest to you, if we really love the Lord, if we really care about people, we need to do some fishing. Not for fish. One evangelist said, the Christian evangelist goes out to catch dead fish that Christ would make them alive. Think about that for a moment. When you pull that fish out of the water, it's no more life. When, when a believer, or when a person does not know the Lord Jesus Christ, they're dead in their sin. But Christ can make them alive. And many, many times God wants to use you and God wants to use me in that process, whatever that process may be. Maybe it's a need, maybe it's a heart, maybe it's a, a person going through some just desperate situations. And if you open up your life and if you show a difference in, in, in your life, wow. I was on the police department and I was working in a division at Durham Regional Police in Bowmanville. And a new fellow came over from headquarters to fill in for one of the regular guys. The regular guys knew who I was, and I, I hope knew where I was coming from. And I worked with this guy for about a week because we had a guy off sick. And he said to me one day, and we happened to be paired up for some reason. We didn't often get paired up because it's a small division, and, and back then, two man cruisers were not really heard of much. But we got paired up. I think it was a it was a jury duty, or not a jury duty, but a strike duty. And he said to me, he said, um, I asked you a question. I said, sure. You don't swear. You don't listen. You don't seem to listen to the stories we tell in the locker room. Why? I'm, you know, pretty timid <laughs> at that point. I don't want. I want to be his friend too. But I just said it's because of God in my life. He laughed and kind of joked about it. But later on, I had another opportunity to talk to that man. I don't know if he ever accepted the Lord or not. 
But I said, it's because the changes happen to me that I'm a child of God and I want God to work in my heart and my life. I've never lost sight of that. I've never stopped praying. I've never stopped asking God to do a work in his heart and his life. I'm going to ask you that question that he asked Peter. Do you love me? I mean, do you love Christ? I would suggest, if not all, most hands would say, yeah, I love the Lord. Do, do they see it in your workplace? I was being interviewed at a church and somebody on the board said, you know, we should ask the pastor when he comes on staff, if, if that's the case, that maybe we should ask him to go to our workplace to see what, what our behavior is like. Huh? That'd be interesting. You know, he goes, he goes to this church, what do you see, what do you see reflect in him? He never did that, never suggested that again. But, but I, I wonder sometimes if, 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 if um, people see you, what, what does Jesus see in you? Jesus is watching all the time. What does Jesus see in you? If you love me, feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. Be about the work of God, not just here, not just for Jason and Robin, and not just for people preaching from there, there here, but your lifestyle will should attract people to say, there's something different about this man and this woman. I want something. I want that peace. I want that sense of God's direction in my heart and in my life. Does it show? Does it show in my heart, in my life, that I love the Lord Jesus Christ with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind? What a challenge. Does it show in your prayer life? Does it show in the relationship you have with God every moment of every day in your life? Peter surely was reminded that he walked away from God. And if we stop and evaluate our relationship with what God desires to do in our hearts and our lives, I pray that it would be so real that it would be evident without even words. But if it's evident without words, when, when, when we're asked, the words must be there. I need to be always ready to give an answer with hope that's in me. Examine that in your own heart. Do people see the hope? What's that look like in you? Challenge for me today, and I'm a little bit two or three areas here, but I hope it's a challenge to, as you think of the fall, and you think of the transition from summer into the fall, the weather's going to get cooler, someday we're going to have that, four letter word, snow. My wife said the other day to the neighbor, I wish it would snow, and she said, what? <laughs> Too hot. But, but think about it for a minute, as we transition, whatever transition you are in life, whether it's work transition, whether it's getting married and transitioning, whatever it might be, just say, Lord, show me the direction that you have. Pray for us as we transition. Pray for one another as we see God's work in, in hand in every one of our lives. Let me just bow for a prayer and just ask God to do it with us. Father, thank you for your goodness. Father, I thank you for Peter because he teaches me so many lessons that sometimes it's a little hard to grasp for me. But I know that you have a purpose and a plan in all things in my life. And Father, I pray that I would keep my eyes fixed on you. Not the circumstances of life, not the difficulties I may face in life, but my eyes fixed on you and allowing you to take control of every area of my life. If there be one person here this morning struggling with their relationship with Christ, if they're struggling with that submission and saying, Lord, I want you to be in control of every part of my life. Father, just simply bow our heads before God and say, Lord, first of all, come in my life if I don't know you. Secondly, Lord, I just want to serve you. And whether it's youth ministry or children's ministry or, or just ministry in, in our workplace, Father, help us to be doing your work. If you really love me, do the work. And Father, I pray that that work would begin in each one of us as we wait upon you. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name.